Okay. We're about to start. So I'm Lucy Soudon. I am a family barrister at Palo Plowden. I also have uh, Chloe Branton here. She's going to do the second half of the, oh, there you go, of the seminar, um, which I hope you will all find interesting. Um, with, there will be some time for questions and answers afterwards. So please uh, feel free to stay about after the slideshow and then we can do some questions. So hopefully the tech will work. I'm not taking any responsibility for it, but Chloe is ably in charge. So if it all goes wrong, blame Chloe, not me. Um, so I'm going to start talking about the Domestic Abuse Act 2021. Apart from having a tech fail already. <laughs> So as you will see, it seems that the uh, politicians are now on board with the hot topic of domestic violence and domestic abuse. And that's uh, one of the reasons behind the Domestic Abuse Act in order to consolidate all the uh, issues relating to domestic abuse. And one of my questions is whether this act actually changes anything or just brings together all the original um, options we have in other legislation. So let's start with the uh, beginning. What is domestic abuse? And section one of the act says that um, domestic abuse is the behavior of one person against another person Um, who are uh, over 16 and personally connected to each other and that behaviour is abusive. And abuse is wider than domestic violence. It includes physical and sexual abuse, violence, and threatening behaviour, controlling or coercive behaviour, economic abuse and psychological, emotional or other abuse. And if you see, it's not just... Uh, whether it's one incident, it also can include a course of conduct. Economic abuse is outlined as to and defined as to what that entails. And of course, you will see that toward includes, can be directed at another person, for example, um, a child. So if there's any abuse towards the child that would have an impact on um, B, then that would class be classed as abuse. Um, so when we're looking at economic abuse, it can uh, entail taking bank cards or PIN numbers. It can look at whether there's access or stopping access to online banking. We often have in, in cases where benefits are paid into other, oh, in this case, A's account and if A isn't providing access to B, then that would be uh, abuse. So personally connected, I think it's a, a very wide definition and very similar to the associate, associated persons from the Family Law Act. Um, if you look at the definition and it says it on that slide, it can be a number of categories and when it defines relative which is a subsection g it includes father mother stepfather stepmother son daughter stepson stepdaughter grandma grandfather grandson granddaughter or uh, of that person or that person's spouse former spouse civil partner or former civil partner so relative has got a very wide description and it also includes brother, sister, uncle, aunt, niece, nephew, first cousin, whether that's by full or half blood or by marriage or civil partnership. 
or formal, a former of those. So it's very wide definition and should generally catch a number of different things. So what the Act does is it brings in two powers of protection. That's the Domestic Violence Protection Notice and the Domestic Violence Protection Order. So it's viewed that these are the new powers of protection, but we'll wait and see if they are. If we turn to the Domestic Abuse Protection Notice, I think this is one of the most interesting things the Act brings in, because this is police powers. Um, and you will see that it is, uh, I think it looks akin to a fixed penalty notice for uh, other crimes where uh, the police are there, they see something and they can give out a domestic abuse protection notice. So you will see in subsection one that it has to be a senior police officer. A senior police officer is defined in the Act as a uh, officer of a relevant police force, and that includes either a local police force, uh, the British Transport Police, or the Ministry of Defence Police. There's a lot of references in the Act to um, army uh, and uh, other forces and their um, managing forces. So it has to also be an officer of at least the rank of inspector. And that's something that we need to keep an eye on. And you'll see that if they can, uh, an officer of at least rank of inspector can give a protective uh, notice if uh, a, there's reasonable grounds for believing that the person has been abusive towards a person age 16 or over who is personally connected. Of course, we've just been through what personally correct connected means. And that B is satisfied that there's reasonable grounds for believing it's necessary to give the notice to protect that person from domestic abuse or the risk of domestic abuse by the person. And if you look at subsection C, it doesn't cover anyone who is under the age of 18. I think uh, we or I certainly come across cases where uh, there's issues with teenagers and parents and where the teenagers are being violent and having issues uh, against their parents. And this certainly isn't something that the, that the police can use to manage such issues. So what does it what does it say? What can we have it to cover? It's very similar to a non-molestation order. It has to it can uh, include that the P cannot cover cannot um, contact the person who's named in the order. So for example uh, the wife, the relative, um, and may not come within a specified distance of any premises in England or Wales in which the person lives. So it is um, just like a normal station order, you can stop them from coming within 50 metres, 100 metres. You have to specify on the order, as in a normal station order, where or what that distance is. And it also can cover the um, akin to an occupation order. So if um, there are the police comes round, there's people fighting within a property with whom they both live, then the police can determine that one person or through a domestic abuse protection notice can say that one person can reside in the property, the other has to be uh, going somewhere else. Um, so it, the court, the police have to consider a number of issues before they make a domestic abuse protection notice. You have to consider the welfare of any person under uh, 18 who is relevant, whether or not that person and P are personally connected. So anyone within uh, who is under 18 who is relevant and not necessarily a, a relative or anything like that. It is interesting, I think, that they, uh, they, the police have to consider 
the opinion of the person for whom the protection notice would be given, but it is not determinative. You will see uh, it's with section four that it's not necessary for the person to whom would be given the protection to consent. So the police have powers where uh, quite often is a case where we have a victim of domestic abuse but doesn't feel like they can uh, stand up against the person, the abuser, the police can still give the domestic abuse protection notice, which I think is quite a, a really helpful level of protection. The, um, when it mentions about giving the opinions of those who are, are relevant, whose interest is relevant, and the person to whom the protection would be given, the, the Act states that the police need to take reasonable steps to uh, discover the opinions. It doesn't further define what reasonable steps are, so I'm sure uh, there is some wiggle room in that. But um, so go, uh, the domestic abuse protection notice must be in writing. As I said earlier, I see it as akin to a fixed penalty notice. If anyone's got one of them um, that's given at the time and it has to be including the grounds that um, they can be arrested without warrant if they've breached the notice, that it will be heard within 28, day, 28 uh, 48 hours uh, in the magistrate's court, and um, it continues until the application has been determined or withdrawn. I see it as more like a, a summons. So when you get a summons for a summary offence, such as driving offence, it has to con uh, consider all that information and it must be personally served by a constable on he. So if the police has uh, reasonable grounds for believing that the person is in breach of the notice, then the police may arrest the person without warrant. And I think, again, that goes back to your usual cases, or it might be just my usual cases, where perhaps the victim doesn't consent to the police being involved, and we know that then the police have to leave, and then the police are then called back another day, and the, the victim still doesn't pursue. However, with a breach of a domestic abuse protection notice, if the police issue or, uh, and personally serve the person with the notice and then are called out again by, for example, a neighbour, then they can still arrest the uh, perpetrator for the breach. It doesn't need the consent of the uh, victim. So I think then this, oh, so the second part of the Domestic Abuse Act introduces the Domestic Abuse Protection Order. So this seems to be the new version of the Non-Molestation Order. And it is probably in line with trying to remove all of our archaic language. It's no longer molestation, it is domestic abuse. Um, again, it is uh, to prevent he from being abusive towards a person aged 16 or over who is personally connected. The uh, definition of personally connected is as previous. So again, it's same as a non mole You can either make an application for a, a domestic abuse protection order or have it in the course of certain proceedings, and we'll come on to that later. So a domestic abuse protection order can either be made for by um, someone who is seeking the protection as per normal or by the police which includes the British Transport Police, the Ministry of Defence Police and it can be the police where either the uh, perpetrator lives or where P, is, where P is at the time or believed to be intending to go and you will see that you can have leave to uh, make the application if 
necessary. If there is uh, an application for a domestic abuse protection order after a domestic abuse protection notice, I feel like we're going to have to shorten these names very quickly, um, the application must be heard or within 48 hours. And that doesn't include the Sunday, either Sunday, Christmas Day, Good Friday or bank holidays, but it does include a Saturday. So you, the police need to be careful of that. The uh, P must be given notice and he's treated as if having had notice if the uh, notice is given at the address where he gave on the domestic abuse protection notice. And if he didn't give an address, then the court can still hear the application if it's satisfied that the chief officer of the police has made reasonable efforts to give the notice. Of course, it may be that these that the perpetrator doesn't provide an address when given the domestic abuse protection notice. So all the police have to do is satisfy the court that they've made reasonable efforts to try ascertain that. It also is important that um, if the matter is brought within the court within 48 hours, but then adjourned, the domestic abuse protection notice continues until it's determined by the court or withdrawn. And it's also important to note that if the uh, perpetrator has been arrested for breach of domestic abuse protection notices and then the case is adjourned, he or she can be remanded in custody until that matter is ascertained and determined. So there are a number of courts that this can be uh, applied for in family proceedings it can be made in a family court like a non-molestation order if it's brought by the police under a domestic abuse protection notice it needs to be made to a magistrate's court in family proceedings the court can make a domestic abuse protection order against p in any family proceedings where both uh, p and the person for whom protection the order would be made a party so I think that would include any private law or any care proceedings. It can also be made in criminal proceedings where either the person has been convicted of an offence or where they haven't been convicted and they've been acquitted it's like uh, currently the police or the Crown Prosecution Service can have a restraining order against the person, whether there's a successful prosecution or not. Uh, the county court can also make a domestic abuse protection order where both P and the person for whom's protection the order would be given are parties and the Secretary of State can determine which proceedings that covers. So in order to get your domestic abuse protection order, then it has to be satisfied, the court has to be satisfied on the balance of probabilities that pay has been abusive. And of course, we know the definition of abuse, which was at the first slide. And it's a person over eight, over age 16, and the person is personally connected. And the court also has to be satisfied that such an order is necessary and proportionate to protect the person from domestic abuse or the risk of domestic abuse. It doesn't matter if the abusive behaviour took place in England or Wales, so it could have taken place on holiday to Ibiza and still be relevant in terms of making the domestic abuse protection order. And again, it doesn't matter whether it took the action, the act took place either before or after the coming into the force of this act. But again, it can't be made for anyone under 18. So the court, as in a normalization order, has to consider the welfare of any person under 18 and the opinion of uh, the person for whom 
protection would be get, given. Again, it's the opinion and not their consent. You see subsection three, they don't have consent. So it could be, um, or I think it could be for another party to make the application or for the court to make the application, even though the person for whom the protection would be given would not agree. It's just another thing to be thrown in the balance for the court to consider. You can make an ex parte uh, without notice, domestic abuse protection order, where it's just and convenient to do so. And the court has to consider the risk if the order was not made immediately and whether the person will be prevented or deterred from doing so or where the person is deliberately evading service. The, you can't have a without notice domestic abuse protection order, though when there has been a domestic abuse protection notice, it must be on notice in that case. And as in a non-mole, if you make an ex party order, then you have to give the he an opportunity to make response representations about the order as soon as it's just um, convenient and at a notice at which at a hearing where notice has been given to all parties. In terms of a, a protection order you can have um, anything within those categories so you can uh, pro prohibit contact, you can uh, prohibit them coming within a certain or a certain distance of either the home or any other specified premises. Again, you've got to specify, but for example, schools or uh, places of work or relatives' uh, homes. So the uh, it could be a restriction or a um, a positive order. Now, if you look at subsection five, it also is akin, or I think it's akin to an occupation order, prohibiting the person from excluding the other person from the property or from them entering the property or requiring the um, person to leave the premises. It seems that at the moment it is the same test as for a domestic abuse protection order and not the higher bar, bar that we currently have for an occupation order. What uh, we do know is that there are uh, some caveats to the power of the court. They, uh, the contents of a non, uh, uh, non order, a domestic abuse protection order uh, must avoid where as far as practicable conflict with the person's religious beliefs, interference with the person's work or attendance at educational establishment or conflict with another court order or injunction to which the person may be subject. If it then states that if you impose a requirement so that the P must do something, you have to specify who is responsible for supervising the compliance. So if you say that uh, P must move out of the property, I think the order has to specify who's responsible for ensuring that he does leave the property. When you determine who should be specified as the responsible person, the court must have some information for it about the suitability from of and of the person proposed to be supervising and the uh, ability to enforce. One thing the act also breaks uh, brings into uh, as an option is the use of electronic monitoring and the supervising person specified does not apply to the uh, use of electronic monitoring but I think it's quite an onerous duty for that person who is named as the responsible person because there is a duty on them and that's stated within the act that they have to make arrangements for the relevant requirements. So, for example, if what P has to do, they have to promote their compliance 
And if they don't comply, or if they have complied with the balance of the uh, order, then they have a responsibility to inform the chief of police. As I said, the Act also brings in the option of electronic monitoring, where P is there, can't be imposed in P's absence, but there is an option of electronic monitoring. What it doesn't say and what I can't find anything about is who pays for the electronic monitoring, which I'm sure is not going to be cheap um, within the order. And mon electronic monitoring can only be ordered if it's available, funnily enough. Um, but the, per the order has to be very carefully drafted if you are imposing electronic monitoring on someone it must specify who's going to monitor the uh, tag, and that person must be as designated by the Secretary of State. So it can't just be anyone, it has to be someone from an approved list. The um, requirements must also be within the face of the order that P must submit to be being fitted with the apparatus, agree not to damage it, and keep it in working order. So the duration of a non uh, of a domestic abuse protection order, uh, it takes effect from the day it is made, and it takes effect over any previous order. So it would displace any previous orders, and you can have it for a specified per period until the occurrence of a specified event, obviously we have to specify within the order what that event is, or to further order. And you can't electronically monitor anyone for more than 12 months. Breach of a domestic abuse protection order. If the person commits an offence, or the person commits an offence, if without reasonable excuse, they fail to comply with any of the requirements within the order. And it goes back to be careful how you draft in your order. You need to be very specific. You, uh, you will see that if you are found guilty of breach, then you can be imprisoned for not more than 12 months within the magistrate's court or fined or imprisoned and fined or indictment, then um, not exceeding five years in prison or fine. You have to choose when uh, deciding whether you want to go for breach, whether you're going for breach or domestic abuse protection order or contempt, you can't choose both. And he, uh, one of the aspects that needs to be considered on top of all of the other requirements is that info, uh, that as we serve on molestation orders, so must a domestic abuse protection order be served on the police. But I think, and if you look at section 41, I think it's the, the duty is on the person or is on pay to notify the, the police within three days beginning on the day that the order is made of their name and aliases and the home address. So in theory, I think it is P that should serve that, but I think it's always helpful if the applicant serves it uh, as they have the interest in serving them and ensuring that the police is aware of that. So that's my part of the um, seminar. And, Hopefully it's, it has been a bit of a rattle through, but of course we can ask questions later. So I'm going to hand over to Chloe. Great, hopefully everyone can see and hear me. Again, if you can put in the chat box if you 
can't. Um, and similarly, if you do have any questions that go along and you're worried you might forget them, um, you can pop those in the chat box and we'll get onto those in due course. So hopefully the uh, PowerPoint will catch up again. It seems to go a little slow when we first swap things over. Yes, there we go. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about part five of the Act. Um, it's the protection for victims, witnesses, et cetera, in legal proceedings is what it's called as. And there's the three sections of the Act there that it predominantly looks at. So special measures in proceedings concerning domestic abuse, prohibition of direct cross-examination and section 9114 orders. Um, it goes into a bit more about those. So dealing firstly with special measures, um, it looks specifically at criminal, civil and family proceedings in the Act, so section 62, 63 and 64. For our purposes, we're obviously looking at section 63, because that's the family law section. Uh, and there's the definition there under section 63, subsection 5 of what a special measure actually is. I'm sure it's something we deal with quite regularly, but there's a handy little definition now there. Um, also referred to as procedural rules, as I'm sure we all know, but I'll mainly be using the term special measures since that's what the Act says. Um, and as we can see, the section applies where rules of the court provide the court may make a special measure direction in relation to a person who's a party or witness in family proceedings. So they don't, of course, need to be the applicant. It could be a witness for the applicant or even potentially um, a witness for respondent or alleged perpetrator. And again, we've got more wording from the statute there about um, what the actual purposes of having the special measures. Um, so if the person is at risk of being a victim of abuse or they are a victim of domestic abuse, um, it's to be assumed that the special measures needed because they are likely to have the quality of our evidence diminished by reason of their vulnerability um, or their participation in the proceedings overall um, if they're a party. Um, and of course, the party to the proceedings, a relative, etc., um, are all included within that. Um, so that leads us on to discussing what I think is quite a helpful case, um, looking at the Domestic Abuse Act, special measures in general, and the practice directions, um, which also assist. So re-emma child, and we've got the citation on there. Um, it looked at how um, section 63 that we just looked at provides that where a person is or is at risk of being a victim of domestic abuse, the court must assume their participation and evidence will be diminished by reason of their vulnerability, um, as we just covered. And um, the case was heard at first instance prior to ReHN and others, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with now. Um, and I suppose I'll plug now as well. We have a seminar coming up in a couple of months from Emily Chipchase and Patrick Hulley on um, fact findings in the post ReHN world. And I'm sure they'll be able to look into ReHN in more detail. Um, but we have that there. And it was this case, Riemma Child, was originally heard at first instance before we had the Domestic Abuse Act passed. Um, but it provides quite a handy little look at the Act and practice directions, because part of the focus of the appeal um, was looking at the issue of special measures or participation directions. And by this point, we did have um, the Act in force. We've got that quote there. And then the practice direction on the screen, um, again, that wasn't in place at the time of the first hearing, but the court was clear that there were still extensive provisions already in place in practice directions, such as Rule 3A and Practice Direction 3A, um, that make it clear to the court how they must consider whether participation directions are required um, and the views expressed by the party or the witness in relation to participating and or giving evidence. There was a clear duty already in place before the um, Act came into force. So the procedural rules. Um, so we've got on the screen there um, some of the procedural rules um, that have been in place and provide some more practical assistance when looking at what the Act means um, rather than looking at it in a vacuum since we are using it in hearings. 
So rule 3.8.7 provides factors the court is to have particular regard to when deciding whether to make a practice direction. Those factors are A to M, and so I've not put them all on the screen, but some of the pertinent examples would be whether the party or witness has a mental disorder or significant impairments of intelligence or social functioning, their age, their maturity and understanding, um, whether any measure is actually available to the court to assist and the costs of that available measure, as well as any of the other matters set out within practice direction 3AA. Um, and so it's very widely drawn, um, specifically with the intention of, of being um, of practical use rather than a constraint, as the last thing we want is um, to have a court feeling that they can't put a practice measure in place because it wasn't specified within the order. So where a court decides that a vulnerable person should give evidence, um, we have on the screen um, PD 3 AA about ground rules hearings. And um, the focus of that particular paragraph, the whole of paragraph five is about ground rules hearings. So, um, so I'm sure we're all familiar with having a ground rules hearing or a, a pre-trial review uh, with ground rules elements, but again, the practice direction provides more assistance on what we should be specifically covering. Um, I think we all sometimes have this feeling that the practice di um, the pre-trial review was almost crept up on us and we need to make sure that we make sure we cover all those um, relevant points to ensure we have an effective hearing for all parties and witnesses. Um, and again, we can see some of the quotes there too about what happened in Emma Child, where it, the case cried out for participation directions and a ground rules hearing, um, not just for the sake of the mother, but for the integrity of the court process itself. And that obligation is um, upon the court. But of course, if an advocate is aware of the issue and doesn't raise it with the court, that's going to be a significant problem there and it was something that was looked at a bit in Emma Child where um, both parties were represented by counsel at the hearings um, leading up to and at the finding of facts and yet participation directions and the need for a ground rules hearing weren't um, seemingly raised by any advocates so whilst the obligations on the court advocates need to be alive to it um, as per the slide, and as we all know, it doesn't need to be a separate hearing in and of itself. It can be part of, say, a pretrial review where you check what allegations are to be pursued, which witnesses are coming, um, as to overall have an effective hearing. Um, and matters, of course, need to be decided so that we don't have a wasted attempt to final hearing. Court time is precious um, and increasingly seeing more and more delays. Um, so it's important that any hearings are listed to be effective. And examples include uh, the things to consider, the form of the evidence that, that person's going to need to give, um, specifically things like sign language, and also whether the evidence orally should be before the hearing's meant to take place. So a quasi-criminal um, system there with uh, whether the witness should give evidence separately. And of course, directing the manner of cross-examination, which um, I'm going to come on to now, as I'm sure we're all familiar with, it's quite a common um, uh, participation direction is to have the alleged perpetrator for a litigant in person send written questions into court in advance for the judge to put and that leads on to something that the act has specifically considered which is the prohibition of cross-examination in person um, it's something we of course all see but it's something the act seems to be wanting to move away from is having the judge um, asking the questions. Um, we can see here the case of Reex um, with his honour judge Willens, and he reflected on the process of having the judge put the written questions sent in an advance for the vulnerable witness um, as part of the proceedings. And he noted that whilst an alleged perpetrator um, had complied in that case with the direction for putting the questions in advance, um, he felt his questions had been fairly put by the judge, but the judge himself noted that he remains less comfortable with the role he's required to assume. He felt the forensic process suffered in being required to effectively put the mother's case for her. And that as a judge, he's not best placed to robustly challenge a witness as to their case. So to be fair to the party putting the questions, whilst not in turn um, overstepping the mark. Um, 
it's something I think judges have, no, have noted for a while to be quite uncomfortable with, and it's something that um, litigants in person might find very strange and advocates might find very strange as well as to how the dynamic will work in the hearing. Um, and so the section 65 of the Act attempts in a way to start to address this issue. So you can see uh, section 65, the prohibition of cross-examination. It inserts into the Matrimonial Family Proceedings Act the following sections, and they're very lengthy, so I won't be reading them all out. Um, but we can see some of the wording on the slide regarding cross-examination directly, either by the alleged perpetrator or the alleged victim in circumstances where the person asking or answering questions has been convicted or given a caution for that offence. Um, and in reality, it's more likely to be impacting the alleged perpetrator, um, given that legal aid funding seems to be more readily available for those who are alleged victims of abuse. And the Act goes on to define those terms, such as conviction, caution, whether they've been spent for the purposes of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, etc. Um, hence it being quite lengthy. It goes on then um, to give Section 31S another very lengthy part. And again, the Act um, under 31S goes on to prohibit direct cross-examination by a party who is the respondent to an on-notice protective injunction of a protected person of that injunction. So a non-molestation order, um, perhaps DAPOs, as, as Lucy's just talked about. Um, and so if a non is in force and respondent to the non mole may not be able to cross-examine the applicant directly and will instead see what happens um, later on with that. We've then got 31T about evidence of domestic abuse. So we're starting to see more catch-alls being widely drawn in effect with 31T and then 31U, which is the widest of them all. So T is where there's evidence a witness has been the victim of domestic abuse by a party, then that party may not cross-examine them directly and then vice versa with the alleged victim not being able to directly cross-examine their alleged perpetrator. Um, there may well be a case where X in the current proceedings is an alleged perpetrator of abuse against A, but A is wants to call a witness, D, and D is then alleged by X to have been domestically abusive in the past. So we can start to see where it might get a little more complicated um, with who is not able to ask things direct, um, either because they are a victim of domestic abuse themselves or they are alleged to have um, perpetrated it on another witness. Um, that's slightly more uh, unusual, we would suspect, but the, the Act's intending to catch those circumstances too. And then finally on this, um, other cases, as it's called, um, as it once again, it's trying to be as widely drawn as possible so as to not have people fall out from the wide umbrella that should perhaps be given the umbrella of protection. And so we can see here, um, focusing on the overall impact of having someone cross examine in person, um, the participants in the hearing itself, it goes on um, to then define things like the quality condition and significant distress condition uh, in more detail, um, with the direction being able to be made by the court, either of its own motion or by an application from a party to proceedings. So again, quite wide powers there for the court. So we've, we've looked at how they can't cross-examine directly, but what can they do then? Well, W provides for the alternatives to cross-examination in person. Um, we know the individual can't cross-examine direct, so what will happen instead of having the judge do the cross-examination through written questions is 31W says we have to consider if there's a satisfactory alternative means for cross-examination or having the information provided that may have been given under cross-examination. Um, if not, we're going to have an advocate at the party purely for the cross-examination of that particular witness. I personally think that satisfactory alternative means that technically you probably still could have the judge put the questions in advance. You might need to see this tested as to what exactly a satisfactory alternative is. Um, but I could see in some circumstances a judge um, trying to crack on with things by saying, well, I'll just put the written questions in advance. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens in reality there. Um, so the alternatives, again, we can see the rest of the 
Act about having the legal representative do the cross-examination, the court will appoint them. Um, they're appointed by the court and they're not responsible to the party, which I personally have some concerns about how that will work in reality. Um, and I think we're left with what I would ultimately say is quite an odd situation of an advocate coming to court to cross-examine perhaps one witness um, and then going off again. Um, that witness might not even be the alleged um, victim. That witness could be quite a minor um, witness um, or they could be the one who's making the main case. Um, they won't be providing any submissions, any documentation for the person that they are representing, given they only represent them for the purpose of the cross-examination. Um, so it's quite an odd situation. I can't help but feel, without sounding a bit political, that the answer would realistically be just to fund legal aid properly, uh, but I won't go into that uh, this evening. So the costs um, and alternatives to cross-examination. Um, we have 31 um, W8 as to what a qualified legal person is, and then 31 X and Y about the funding and regulations of that legal representative. Uh, there's a similar set of rules for the civil proceedings too, which I won't go into uh, given our family will focus, but it seems interesting to me to again go into the purpose of having this rather bizarre scheme rather than just adequately funding uh, family justice. So the provisions, um, it's quite fortunate that we're doing this seminar um, on Tuesday the 19th, I hope it's the 19th um, of July, because the Ministry of Justice published the statutory guidance just last week um, to confirm the provisions are going to come into force on Thursday the 21st, so in two days time. Um, the guidance um, that I've put a link to on the slide and you'll get the slides after uh, to click it. Um, the guidance provides information on the, rule, the role of the qualified legal representative in terms of duties, their remit, responsibilities, um, HMCTS appointment and termination process, uh, working with prohibited parties and um, process of claiming payment from the LAA. Um, and again, we've got the link there for you if you're interested in reading up on that more. Um, so we come on to what I would sort of say is the last big part of part five um, and this is looking at section 9114 orders. Um, it introduces introduce section 91a uh, into the Children Act um, and we can see there about what the section 9114 order is. It allows the court to order further applications in relation to child or children may not be made by the party name without the court's permission. Um, idea being to prevent unnecessary and disruptive applications because the applicant needs permission first. Um, they're often referred to people as by people as barring orders. Uh, I'd say it's a bit of a misnomer since we don't actually bar applications because you can still make one, you just need permission first. And that might perhaps link us to why um, the Act's trying to encourage their use since they've got a bit of a reputation um, in case law has been a draconian order and in some respects they, they are since you have to get permission but I think the act is sort of indicating that it thinks there's been too much of a fear of using them and seems to want to emphasize that the court's powers under section 9114 don't need to be used as sparingly as one might first think from the case law. So we've got here on the screen um, section 91a um, amending um, part of the original section 9114 of the Children Act and then adding in section 91A with the new clause clarifying that such orders are available where proceedings are causing harm, particularly where they could be in itself a form of continuing abuse by making continuous applications and reminding that the court can make an order on their own initiative. So mm -hmm. if a respondent to a section 9114 order wishes to apply for permission to make an application, the court must consider whether there has been a material change of circumstances uh, when deciding whether to grant that application. Uh, and then subsection five, which is not on your screen, uh, provides that the order may be made by the court, either on application by the relevant individual or on behalf of the child or anyone else who's a party to the application or of its own motion, uh, once again. So um, 
I've sort of talked a little bit already about the aim of this change. Um, we have a link there to the report, Accessing Risk of Harm to Children and Parents in Private or Children Cases from June of 2020. Um, the report looks at how the Family Court protects parents and children in domestic abuse cases. Um, and it included a review in itself of section 9114. So there's a link to this report if you're interested. It's about 200 uh, pages. I had a bit of a skim. I can't uh, say I've read it all, but it's quite uh, an interesting guide that may have been part of the catalyst of including um, the parts about section 9114 in the Domestic Abuse Act, um, given the timing of the report being June 2020 and then the act coming in in 2021. So that's some, some food for thought to see you all there. Um, but it overall concluded that 9114 orders weren't being used enough to prevent perpetrators continuing to abuse by making applications um, under the Children Act uh, and felt that amendments to 9114 in the Act should be made uh, with the hope ex expressly that more of these orders would be put, um, put in force by the family courts. Um, It'll be interesting to see in reality over the next few years, um, even just anecdotally, whether we start to see more applications or more successful applications for 9114 orders uh, within Children Act proceedings. Uh, so we heard from Lucy at the start about the idea of whether it's a new era with politicians perhaps focusing more on domestic abuse. Um, it might be premature to say that we're heading into a new era, who knows? Um, in many respects, I would say that it's an attempt to codify or to um, jazz up existing provisions, either with the aim of them being used more or in, or in the hope of just simply drawing attention um, to these uh, issues. It just remains to be seen whether it will have any practical uh, difference not just for us as professionals, but for the people in these cases as to whether it really has a true impact on, on their lives and their children's lives. Um, I'm interested in particular in seeing what's going to happen now with the introduction of advocates coming in for the cross-examination, perhaps over the next few months, we might start to, to see that happening. Um, and I will be interested to hear anyone's views on that. Um, so that leads on to whether people have any questions I'll be able to stop seeing the screen we might be able to see some of you uh, we've got the chat function box um, and I'm going to end the recording before we start questions so you don't need to uh, worry about um, having your question recorded but uh, thank you all for for attending <laughs>